The Honourable Ratna Omidva was appointed by Prime Minister Trudeau in April 2016 to the Senate of Canada as an independent senator representing Ontario. The senator's contributions to Canadian society were recognized by the Globe and Mail when it named her as its nation builder of the decade for citizenship in 2010. She was named to the inaugural Global Diversity List sponsored by The Economist magazine in 2015. No, global, not just Canada, global diversity list where she was listed as one of the top 10 diversity champions worldwide. In 2016, she also received Lifetime Achievement Awards from Civic Action and the Canadian Urban Institute, honoring her strong commitment to the civic leadership and to city building. The Senator is a member of the Order of Canada and the Order of Ontario, and both of these honors were awarded in recognition of her advocacy work on behalf of immigrants and her devotion to reducing inequality in Canada. The Senator is the current co-chair of the Global Future Council on Migration, hosted by the World Economic Forum, and serves as a councillor on the World <coughs> Refugee Council, whose work is coordinated by our partner, CG. She is the founding executive director and currently a distinguished visiting professor at the Global Diversity Exchange at Ryerson University. The Global Diversity Exchange, and I love this phrase, is a think and do tank, think and do, on diversity, migration, and inclusion that connects local experience and ideas with global networks. It is dedicated to building a community of international leaders who see prosperity in migration. The Senator has a very distinguished record indeed in community building in Canada. There can be few people as well qualified to speak on issues relating to refugees, migration and community building than the Senator. Please give her a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. That was, uh, it always is slightly discombobulating to hear things about yourself in that way, but thank you, sir. And thank you for inviting me. I, I'm maybe all of those things, but at heart, I'm a storyteller. So I want to tell you the story of me, not because I'm a narcissist or anything, but I like to place my work in my experience. And I think you can do the best work that you can do if there is a base of authenticity. Uh, so the first thing you need to know about me is I'm a risk taker. Uh, I was born in India and I decided early 1970s to study in West Germany. West Germany at that time, West Germany, East Germany, was a country which was trying to come to terms with itself. There was one generation that was trying very hard to explain its role in the war and there was the next generation that was trying very hard to say that had nothing to do with me. It was also a, a time of great civic upheaval. You will remember uh, the Bader, Meinhof, Gruppe and, and people like that. Uh, I was with, like many of you, I was in a class like this with a group of many students including many foreign students and I did something uh, that, that is pretty ordinary in Germany, in Bavaria. On the weekends, you pack your Brotzeit and you go hiking up the Alps, which I did. And I went up with one foreign student and I came down with him uh, back uh, to the base and we knew that we were going to be life partners. He was from Iran. So when our studies finished, we went, I took a risk, I said, ha. Hey, India, Germany, let's try Iran. That, that may be, you know, in, in hindsight, uh, maybe not the wisest choice at that time. This was 1975. The Shah was still in full imperial glory, but those who could read the tea leaves knew that there was dissent brewing. But we lived ordinary lives. We were fairly ordinary people, and I'm sure like many of the people 
who are no longer in Syria, uh, we thought, this revolution is not going to touch me. And in the end, and this is the, the one observation I take away, in the end, you cannot be an island unto yourself. What happens around you impacts you. And one night, uh, it impacted us in a pretty ferocious way. And we had to very quickly, very quietly, pack our bags, our little one-year-old child, and take a bus, because in the meantime, the airport was bombed. We had to take a bus up to the Turkish border to quietly find our way across to Turkey. And I will tell you this one story because it stays with me and it resonates with me even today. We are in a room, it's roughly the size. One side of the room is Turkey, it's got a picture of Ataturk. One side of the room is Iran, we're on this side. It's got a picture of Khomeini on it. And we want to go where Ataturk is. And we're surrounded by young soldiers, soldiers no more than 15 or 16 years old, who've been all of a sudden enfranchised, empowered. They have weapons. Um, there is, I can still almost remember the fear that I could smell, and it's not just our fear. It was the fear of these young boys who didn't quite know what to do. Uh, but they had the weapons, and I think you will all understand that, that fear and weapons are a toxic combination. So there we were, trying very hard to get across to the other side, and I'm thinking, standing there with my husband and child and saying, if I ever get over to that other side, I will never ask God for anything again. And I'm not a religious person, I am a spiritual person. And uh, the soldiers went through all our belongings, including uh, the, the bags of, of dried milk, but they didn't. Now here comes resilience. They didn't look in the metal tubes of the baby carriage. And inside those metal tubes, we had our life savings that would hold us in good stead once we got over. Well, we got over, we went to, back to Germany, which was natural. Germany was not a country of immigration. We applied to come to Canada. Canada was not as open to my application, and then later on, through freedom of information, I found out why. My husband had done his military service in Iran, and for them, for the Canadian officials, military service equated military action, and on such small misunderstandings, lives are made or destroyed, but luckily I had friends uh, who had friends who had friends, lesson number two, social capital, always matters, who had friends who had friends, and we were in Canada six months after being apply, after applying and being rejected once. So those were the timelines. And I remember when we got to Canada how, you know, you think, oh my gosh, Canada, everything is going to be great. And you are happy and you're excited because you're safe and secure and nobody is going to yank and put you away into jail. But reality also hits the ground. And, you know, life here outside the weather, which was horrible, it still is horrible, we had to learn many things, and we had to unlearn many things. And there are, still today, I talk about the written and unwritten rules of behavior that govern a very polite society, so polite that it's very hard for people who don't come from this super polite uh, communication to understand what are you really saying? I mean. Uh, can I, are you going to open your door to me or are you not going to open your door? It's very coded. And it's, it's I, I see heads nodding, primarily heads of people who come from this kind of learning. It is something we have to learn. So, so for instance, and I'll give you an example, where I come from, Indians, and I imagine much of that part of the world, we are naturally curious about other human beings. <laughs> we want to know everything about you. Being curious is being human. And in Canada, you learn that it is impolite to be curious. That, you know, uh, I, I would ask people in the beginning, where do you live? Where do you come from? Uh, what's your father doing? This is all the Indian thing, you know, put someone in their little box so you can navigate with them. 
But here, not so much. And of course, the worst thing you could do was ask someone how much you earned, because that was an absolute no-go. I go back to India, and people ask me today, Senator, how much do you earn? And I will be polite, and I say, I will say, not enough. And that is the truth. <laughs> that is the truth. Um, I was always also advised in my first few days, first week, and Besma will relate to this, to do something. I was told to change my name. And I was, said, I was told that the combination of my first name and my last name was too difficult, too complicated, too strange, nobody would remember my name, and worse, nobody would give me a job. And that really, that was, that was serious stuff, not getting a job when you come almost penniless. You've got to get, put food on the table. So I actually thought about it. I thought about it for three days, and for three days I gave myself a different name. On day one, I was Rita. Then I was Rosa, and then I was Rhoda. And in the end, it was all a no-go. And I'm really pleased I kept my own name. But I realize that there is a systemic issue, and I hope I can get to it. But I did change lots about myself. And, and you know, this is the other thing. Uh, resilience, risk-taking, renewal, this is all part of what I think um, many people are about. I figured out because when I graduated from university in Germany, I, I was very interested in German literature. I, I loved the Sturm und Drang and all of that. Uh, and my degree is in German literature, and I'm technically a teacher of German as a second language. And I realized very quickly, no one in their right mind in Canada would want to learn German from an Indian who had just come from Iran as a <laughs> refugee. So. I reinvented myself, and I reinvented myself in different ways. And in truth, it is that reinvention that has brought me to where I am today and, and, and in the Senate. So I think of these, these, hallmark, these are hallmarks not just of one immigrant life, but in fact of an immigrant nation. Reinvention, renewal, resilience, and innovation. I want to talk a little bit about the global migration picture uh, before I get on to what I see as, as the challenges and the opportunities. And wherever possible, I'm going to encourage us all to look at evidence. Because, because immigration, migration is such a hotly contested field, not so much in Canada, but especially south of the border, and social license has been given, I think, to talk about issues and people in a certain way. We, we have to, what can we rest on? We can rest on values and we can rest on evidence. So I'm going to try and encourage us to do that. And one of the people who's done great work in exploring and dispelling myths is an, is an academic at Maastricht called Hein de Haas. And I would urge you to look at his writings and his blogs and his uh, wonderful YouTubes on migration myths. And I'm going to play a little game with you called Truth and Lies. So I'm going to put some facts on the, on, on, on the table and ask you to respond to them. Is that a truth or is it a lie? Fact number one, there are 250 million people on the move. Truth or lie? This number has never been higher before. Truth or lie? Truth. It is the truth. Never before have we seen so many people on the move. But you look at that figure and you compare it with the population of the world. The population of the world has also grown. So has global migration. The ratio stays relatively the same, 3%. So I urge you to look at things in, not just in, in, in one way, but surround them with other facts. Let's take a look at another, at another number, and that is 65 million. Who, who knows what 65 million refugees? Thank you. 65 million refugees in the world today. 22.5 uh, of these are internally displaced. Over half of these children are refugees. So the question is, do we have a global refugee crisis? Actually, no. It's still, relatively speaking, refugees are just 7 to 8 percent of the global migrant population. I will not uh, uh, underplay 
the reality of their lives. Uh, and if there is a crisis, it's not so much in, in refugee, in, in global refugee movements, it's in global governance. And, and maybe we can talk about that. Uh, and of course, who thinks that Europe and North America, Europe is being overrun by refugees? Fact? Yeah, well, thank you. Which countries are being overrun by refugees? Jordan, Syria, Libya, uh, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and Pakistan. So, whereas Europeans used to move to these parts of the world, now these parts of the world are moving uh, uh, to Europe. And, and these patterns have changed dramatically since the Second World War. There are also other popularly held myths, and I won't spend too much time about them, over them, but there's one, immigration leads to brain drain. Yes, maybe, but look at the level of remittances. There's some, some, some things to think about there. There's another myth, development aid to source countries prevents migration, not true. The more educated a nation, the more migration happens. And of course, the famous one, immigrants create a downward pressure on jobs. And I think if you look at the writings of Giovanni Perry and it's others like that, you will know that that's not exactly true. So where does this leave us? I mean, the truth is really hard. I think you look at the truth based on your value set. I think that immigration, at least for a country like Canada, is an opportunity. It's one of many tools to use in nation building. It's not the only tool. It's one of many tools we must deploy. If we want to continue to be a society uh, which wants to grow, which is globalized and cosmopolitan, then we have to also accept the fact that there will be an ongoing labor demand that will not only be met by our by domestic Canadians, that we must always be open to migration on, uh, of this kind and of that kind. If we want to close our doors to migration, and we're nowhere near that in Canada, there are other countries, then you have to accept a different economic reality. This is a very uh, <laughs> conflicted debate, partly because of what is happening south of the border. I will say for my part that you find the good, the bad, the ugly, all of this in the immigration and migration debate. And if I had time, I would give you examples. But I do want to get on to what I think are in all of this noise. There is a little bit of music. I'm, as I said, I'm somewhere, I think I said earlier, I like to see the glass as half full. I think there are opportunities that arise out of the challenges that we are pre being presented. So let me go back to refugees. Uh, the challenge, as I said, is maybe not so much in refugee flows, but in our inability to manage them and to respond to them. And that, that lies in governance. Um, international government systems have been unable, I believe, to respond to irregular migration. Um, so the numbers speak for themselves. 5,000 people died in the Mediterranean. Uh, the number of refugees from Syria in Lebanon are 25% of that population. So we, we have to think differently about refugees. And here's the challenge. We rely on the UNHCR for its definition, management, and governance of a collective response to irregular and, reg and regular migration. The definition of refugees as it was conceived in 1952 responded to a very particular post-Second World War context. It no longer applies today. But everyone is in agreement, quietly, that, that, that redefining the UNHCR definition would be, would take us to a, a, a to a, uh, to a lower place as opposed to a higher place. So in other words, the, ref the definition of refugees would become more constricted as opposed to modernized. Uh, there's a lot of agreement that the innovation around the definition of refugees needs to happen on the outside. And I'm very pleased to see Rohinton here as the head of CG. I'm involved with CG on the World Refugee Council. Um, and, and there are a number of opportunities around non-institutionalized 
initiatives such as the World Refugee Council to have both an influence on what the UN is doing and saying and thinking, but also to raise the bar outside on issues like how should we define refugees? What is the role of technology in, in management? And what can the private sector do? I was, had the good fortune to be at uh, Davos last year. And the most interesting thing I heard on a panel on refugees came from the CEO of MasterCard, who said, and MasterCard, you know, is, is helps in refugee resettlement in camps overseas by disseminating aid through American, through MasterCard. And he said that if the world wants the corporate sector to play a bigger role in refugee resettlement and integration and refugee management, we are ready to do that. But then the world must also be prepared to accept a modicum of corporate profit, a modicum of corporate profit. And I think these are some of the new ideas that the World Refugee Council may well want to, uh, want to think about. In addition, uh, we had a meeting with uh, some people from, uh, from the school earlier. We talked about the opportunities or the lack of opportunities, as you may see, that are represented in the two new global compacts, one on migration and one on refugees, that are being talked about and constructed uh, to be tabled in, in 2018. Um, and I, my problem with, with those compacts is that A, they are non-binding on members, and they, even if they result in state-to-state -state you know, uh, collaboration and resolution, sort of, let's say, collaboration between uh, Jordan and Lebanon and Lebanon and Turkey or, or Libya and Germany, they won't really change the system as much as provide ideas that can be scoped out into policy. The World Bank, I, I, I take some, uh, uh, some encouragement from what the World Bank, an institution which has always said, uh, we are about development, we're not about migration. But all of a sudden, they have entered uh, the equation, they are giving uh, loans, World Bank loans only go to developing countries. And Jordan, technically, a middle-income country, is not a developing country, but they have given a new loan to Jordan, which will help both Jordanians and Syrian refugees in the camps to develop their entrepreneurial uh, capacities so that at some point today or in the future, those entrepreneurial links can be made. So I think there are new ideas uh, that, that need to be thought about. Um, and, and at the World Refugee Council, we are lucky enough to have the former president of Tanzania. Uh, and he we, we always look to the West for solutions, and I think some of the best ideas come from places that we don't think about. Tanzania gave citizenship in one stroke to 150,000 plus Rwandan refugees, I understand. Uganda gives land grants to, to South Sudanese refugees who cross the border, and this is not because they are overly compassionate or generous, that may be part of it, they too are in a, in a phase of nation building. So I think, again, looking at these, these issues as opportunities as opposed to challenges would serve us well. I have been um, uh, in the news a little bit more than I like to. I'm not someone who craves public attention. But I have made some statements about opportunities of a different kind that Canada could be facing, and that is uh, uh, as a result of President Trump's uh, decision to, uh, to do away with the deferred uh, deportation program for DACAers or DREAMers, as you may call it. Now, I think the best solution for the DREAMers and for the Americans is to somehow sort this out so that young people who've grown up in the United States, who have their lives in the United States, who throw no fault of their own, these are really, some of them, the, the, the largest percentage of DREAMers came to the United States when they were six or older. Now imagine that, you're punishing a child of six. Uh, so uh, I think they need to sort this out. And there may be, I've begun to hear that there may be some uh, ideas of a compromise brewing. I really wish that it works out for them, but if it doesn't, I've, I've been asked what Canada should do, and my response to both 
this uh, opportunity, as I call it, the opportunity for the dreamers and the challenge that we face in Quebec with the crossing over into Canada by the Haitian refugees is this. Canada is, is, is a successful society because it is, it is true to, its, to three words in our constitution. We're about peace, order, and good governance. And I want to stress good governance. We have systems and approaches, instruments and policies that serve us well. Um, in, in the case of the, of the DREAMers, we don't need any new programs. We have our uh, economic integration streams. We have family reunification for those who'd like to use that if they can. We have uh, the humanitarian compassionate stream, although most DREAMers do not see themselves in, in that picture. They see themselves as contributing to an economy. And I think if they choose to turn their eyes to Canada, they will use the economic stream. But more, most importantly, we have, we have the international student stream. Uh, and and uh, they could very easily think of Canada as a place to complete their undergrad and graduate uh, education and so enter the path of citizenship through that way. I know there are complexities. There isn't too much time to answer any of these, and my time is, uh, is, uh, is, is sort of uh, uh, drawing to an end. I would have liked to talk about conscious unconscious bias, and names, but I won't. I will go instead to what I think is the greatest challenge of our time in Canada today and the greatest opportunity. And that is an opportunity to build our nation again through something extraordinary that we can all do together. And I think of the big moments of nation building. You know, when we brought our nation together through these cobbled arrangements, when we built our railway east to west, more, late, more recently, I think, when so many Canadians stepped up to the plate to sponsor Syrian refugees. Our greatest challenge today, I believe, deals, has to do with reconciliation. Reconciliation with our past and with our shameful history and treatment of Native people. And here's, here's where I see the opportunity. Uh, we have two two groups of people in Canada, the newest and the oldest people, Canada's indigenous peoples and Canada's immigrants. By the way, these are the only two segments of our population that are growing. Both, we both to some extent, at least in the beginning, live on, on the parameters of society. We both strive to maintain our language and culture. We both to some extent have experienced loss and displacement. And I think there may well be a shared bond. But the challenge is that we never talk to each other. Canada's immigrants and Canada's indige indigenous people structurally do not talk to each other. Think of the way we have built our society. Uh, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, multicultural Canada, there's Francophone Canada, there's the Anglophone Canada, and then there's uh, the Indian Act and everything. So it's structurally we are held apart. And we also don't come together socially quite simply uh, for the reason most immigrants choose to leave, live in urban settings. And even though uh, many indigenous peoples are moving to urban centers, they're moving to urban centers in the West where the numbers of immigrants are a little bit more muted than let's say Vancouver or, or, uh, or Toronto. And you know, I, I took my citizenship test many years ago, 1987 or something like that. And I remember taking a course on Canadian history. And I still remember the lens through which that course was taught. It was taught to us through the lens of the colonizers. I think if, if we are to truly reconcile with our past, then we have to start teaching our children and our new citizens our history through a different lens and not through that lens. So that, I, I think that there are ways Canada, uh, Canada's immigrants and Canada's native peoples can come together and must come together. There is a great deal of ignorance and miscommunication on both sides. Immigrants, for one, do not understand 
why the people who have the longest, most historic stake in their nation have the least play in it. We don't get that. Indigenous people, on the other hand, I believe, maybe rightly so, are, are, uh, are unhappy about the prominence immigrants get in society, especially when they are so successful. So I think there's something uh, we can do. And, and some of these changes are structural. For instance, the oath to Canada that we take as new citizens should include a mention of Indigenous peoples. This is Recommendation 94 of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The government of Prime Minister Trudeau and Minister Hussain has undertaken to complete this, uh, uh, this undertaking, but I don't know when it will be. Um, but the relationships must also be personal, and I think this is a huge gap we have to build. I have just recently heard of a group of private sponsors in northern British Columbia that is led by indigenous peoples, and they have sponsored a Syrian family. Now, those are the ties that will bind and the ties that will keep together. Uh, I am very fortunate. I now count uh, three or four incredible indigenous senators as my friends and mentors, but I encourage you know, each one of us to look outside our circle. I'd like to know if there was someone here in this room who had indigenous roots. I'm not sure, I'm not able to say. But these are the places that include and the places that exclude. So I will leave you with a few good ideas for yourself uh, to think about as you start your new year, and these are drawn from my life. First of all, embrace risk. I'm always a little challenged when, when people say to me, um, I'm, I'm gonna be this. At a very young age, they say, I'm going to be an astronaut or a doctor, and I'm saying, Why? you're young, explore the world. Oh, keep, your, keep yourself open to new opportunities. You don't know what will come through the door. When I became a refugee, I was a banker. Back, look at the opportunity it gave me. At the same time, remain authentic. I think the, the, one of the greatest challenges I see in some of the writings of people who graduate from schools of yours is they, they, they somehow emotionally and uh, they may be intellectually very grounded but they're emotionally div uh, divorced from the real lives of people. I would say to you get involved. Get your, you can't be a gardener without getting your hands in the earth so get involved and get engaged possibly locally. I'm a huge believer in local engagement. If you can, and your professors allow you to, focus on solutions and not simply on describing and redescribing and re redescribing the problem from yet another lens. Try and focus on solutions. And finally, become a reconciler. In your own life, become a reconciler and find something you can do to make this decade a decade of reconciliation. I think I'll stop there. In my 20 minutes. Thank you. Um, in thanking the senator and bringing this very stimulating uh, lunch uh, exchange to a close, uh, just two or three quick thoughts. Uh, one is just how much we all learned uh, about ourselves and the world around us through what was, um, the senator said storytelling, but actually what she embodies is that storytelling and being driven by science and evidence are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they feed off each other, and I thought we got uh, a very good uh, example of that this morning. Second, to think creatively. Uh, the refugee issue and immigration has been, us, been with us through history. And when at CG, we were thinking about uh, striking this uh, global endeavor, this commission, to, to think about re uh, refugees uh, uh, in, in this context and the gaps in governance about them, because they are huge at present. Uh, Senator Midmer was an obvious person to join, and so I'm grateful that you joined us. I know you've met once, and, and there will be three or four meetings of the commission, and they will be the richer because of your contributions. So thank you for that. Uh, politeness, uh, and a very good exchange on that. My own sense uh, is Canada has very made-in-Canada solution um, 
on politeness, which is when people ask you your salary, uh, usually the Canadian response might well be not quite the polite go buzz off, but that's what sunshine lists are for, this is, <laughs> is the way I'd put it. Uh, and last and not least, uh, the Senate is an organization that has gone through ups and downs, and I think it's fair to say that the Canadian Senate is going through a resurgence. It's going through a resurgence, and we just witnessed in the last hour or so how lucky we are to have someone like you, uh, Senator, in the Senate uh, doing not just sober second thought, but so much primary thinking. And if we all agree that Canada is a rich country because of the diversity and the people in it, and that we're generally, despite, you know, uh, it's not a perfect country, despite uh, blemishes that we're well governed and that we're lucky to be here, it's because we have people like you in high office as well. So thank you again. John, thank you for hosting us, and, and Senator, thank you for joining us.